Heavenly Father, I thank you so much for this opportunity that we have to come together and to discover your word better. And I pray, Lord God, that you would guide and direct our conversation this evening, make my teaching clear, and hopefully be of benefit to your saints as they try to understand your word better. Guide and direct us through this evening and use us for your glory, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, Bible books review. If you don't have the books of the Bible memorized, please feel free to look at the first couple of pages of your Bible and chat along with us as we begin with Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, Joshua, Judges, Ruth, 1st and 2nd Samuel, 1st and 2nd Kings, 1st and 2nd Chronicles, Ezra, Nehemiah, Esther, Job, Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, Song of Solomon, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Lamentations, Ezekiel, Daniel, Hosea, Joel, Amos, Obadiah, Jonah, Micah, Nahum, Habakkuk, Zephaniah, Haggai, Zechariah, Malachi. New Testament, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts, Romans, 1st and 2nd Corinthians, Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, 1st and 2nd Thessalonians, 1st and 2nd Timothy, Titus, Philemon, Hebrews, James, 1st and 2nd Peter, 1st, 2nd, 3rd John, Jude, Revelation. Rita missed out on that, so we're going to start over. I'm kidding. Oh. <laughs> This evening, um, and again, guys, I, I'm so proud of the way that you're memorizing those books. It makes it easier for you when you're trying to find something, when the preacher's going through various different, from here to there, or you're reading through a commentary and it says, hey, and this, and it's, it's good to know if you're in Jonah, okay, if I'm going to go to Ecclesiastes, do I go that way or that way? You know, and so having the books of the Bible uh, in your head is a helpful tool. Tonight, I want to speak to a man by the name of James Strong. Some of you may have in your library at home a Strong's Concordance. It's a great big old hefty book you use to kill big roaches. Okay, this is, this is one of those you can get one in the corner pretty quick with. All right, it's always been a huge book. But let me kind of bring you up to speed on what this book is. You know, every Wednesday night, I try to answer questions that you guys bring me from your personal study, from just interactions with the news, interactions with life. And you say, okay, what's going on with, what does the Bible say about? And I love to answer those questions. I've got one question on the board back there that wasn't there when I started preparing this. But my point is, um, if you need a question answered, put it out on the uh, yellow pad out on the foyer on the connections table. Just write down whatever your question is. I'll do the research and I'll bring it to you for the next Wednesday night. Um, tonight, because I didn't have a question, I wanted to go back to a discussion about how to study the Bible that we've had periodically through uh, the months and years that I've been here and that we've been doing this. And one of the primary tools for people in the pew is a Strong's Concordance. If you want to understand your Bible a little better or find things, this is a great tool. If you've been in church very much, you've probably had a pastor say something along the lines of, in the original language, this word means, well, how do you think he knows that? Strong's Concordance. Okay, so you can do the exact same thing and find out what that word means in its original language. The Bible was written in three languages. Okay? The first was Hebrew, the second was Aramaic, and the third is Greek. So the Old Testament is in Hebrew and Aramaic, and the New Testament is written in Greek. And so... As we look at the Bible, we read it in the English, 
and it's been very well translated. The various translations of the Bible, whether it's King James, New King James, uh, English Standard Version, American Standard Version, New International, um, New American Standard, uh, I mean, pick Century, there's a whole bunch of them out there. Message. They're basically written in different styles by different sizes of groups. You know, NIV had over 70 different um, scholars working on it. Whereas when you read the message, that's one guy. Uh, Eugene Peterson did all the translative work himself. So it's just, so it's whether it's one guy doing it, a group doing it, that sort of thing. But they all use tools. And I wanted to talk to this idea about the strong concordance of the Bible. To begin with, maybe. Yep. I think you got. We are experiencing technical difficulties. Please stand by. Oh, well, that's lovely. There it is. All right. So let's talk about James Strong. It's not called Strong's Concordance because you have to be strong to lift it. That, that's not what's going on here. No. It's named Strong's Concordance because James Strong wrote it. Uh, he did this work, and he has, uh, you know, if you ever look at the title, it's got James Strong LLD STD. So what in the world's up with that? That is a um, doctorate in law and a doctorate in sacred theology. Uh, the gentleman was a professor at a theological college. And so here in just a second, I'll read the introduction. He lived from 1822 to 1894. Here's the important thing that you need to know about that. He published this book in 1890. Okay, this was his seminal work. This was the last thing that he published. He published several theological books that are still in use um, today. But he designed this, and I'll just read this first paragraph out of the book. It says, in 1890, Dr. James Strong, professor of exegetical theology at Drew Theological Seminary, published his monumental concordance to the Holy Scriptures. The fruit of 35 years' labor by Dr. Strong and more than 100 colleagues. His volume has since become the most widely used concordance ever compiled from the King James Version of the Bible, still the standard English version of the Bible. Assisted without the aid of computers or other electric devices, Strong's has stood the test of time and has conferred Professor Strong vision for a complete, simple, and accurate concordance that would become, quote, a permanent standard for purposes of reference, unquote. And so what he was trying to do was trying to create a concordance. A concordance is simply a list of words. Imagine sitting down with your Bible and the first word, in. Okay, there's an in. It's in Genesis chapter 1. The. There's a the. It's in Genesis chapter 1. Beginning. Beginning, Genesis 1, 1. For all 14,000 words in the Bible. That's what this book is. Strong spent 35 years not just listing out every single word in the Bible, but also then doing the dictionary work behind it to de demonstrate what that word means in its original language. So he not only worked with the English, he also was working with the Hebrew, the Aramaic, and the Greek to begin to put this book together. So there is a ton of information in it, and I want to teach you how to use it. That's my whole point tonight. The key takeaway, and that's what I've got down here at the bottom, is to remember that Strong's numbers are always coded to the King James. I say that because if you're reading an NIV or an NASB or some other version, and you're like, well, it says in this sentence this word, 
So I'll grab my Strong's and look that word up. Well, wait a minute, time out. You need to flip open your King James and see how it's worded there because that's what Strong used. When he was writing in 1890, the NIV was still 80 years away. The NASB was still 80 years away. It hadn't even been invented yet. So he was using the standard Bible of his time, which was the King James Version. And so words will have changed, but everything in the Strong's is based on the King James Version. Okay? So if you'll go ahead and go to that next page, we'll talk through a little bit here of what's going on. What I wanted to do with this slide was simply to show you that he's actually done the work. Say you look up a name, either somebody's name or a town name or a country name, something along that lines. How many of you have already figured out there is a fistful of Marys in the Bible? Okay, so you look up Mary. How many Marys are there? Well, that's what I'm showing you in this slide here. As we look, the name here is Joyarib. And I just grabbed this one for fun. Just flipped open the Strong's and grabbed this one. And what I want you to see there is there's a one, a two, and a three. And so what's being demonstrated here is Joyarib was a messenger for Ezra. And we see him in Ezra 8.16. He was also a descendant of Perez. And we see that in Nehemiah 8, 11, 5. He, there was also a father of Jediah, and we see that in Nehemiah 11, 10, 12, 6, and 12, 19. Now, you're going to have to do your Bible study and argue with him to see, are there three people, or are this just three different references? Okay. But, for example, you look up Joseph. Are you talking about the son of Jacob? Are you talking about the stepdad for Jesus? Or are you talking about Arimathea, the guy whose tomb, I mean, there's, there's three Josephs that I can think of just off the top of my head, and I haven't even looked to see what Strong has to say, but there's three different men named Joseph, so you're going to get different passages in Scripture. Okay, so then what I wanted to do tonight was to just jump in to one particular word that I thought would be simple and easy, and that's what the next page is. This is actually the bottom right hand of one page. Turn the page and the top left of the next page because happy is actually on two different pages. So I want to show you tonight how the Strong's Concordance works so that you can understand how valuable a tool it can be. So you have happy down here, these last few lines, and then this whole area up here is also happy. I want you to notice that there are capital letters over here. Okay, I'll step out of the way so you can see it. You've got capital letters and small letters because that happens to start the sentence and that one's in the middle of a sentence. Standard English rules apply. If the thing starts off with a capital word, it's the first word in the sentence. Okay, So you'll notice there's just this H. H, 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 H. That's because they didn't want to take up the space to write happy every single time. The word you're dealing with is happy. So they just put the H in there. You'll notice that most of these are at the front. But you get down here to this one, and the happy is clear out here. The one out here. That one's back at the beginning. That one's back out here. What it's giving you is a very short snippet of the verse that it's in. So as we look at this first one, happy am I for the daughter's will, da 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 da. But that verse is Genesis chapter 30 and verse 13. So what this book is doing is it is outlining every single place that the Bible uses the word happy. So he's gone through all the work to pull out every single happy and list them. So you'll notice Genesis, Deuteronomy, Second King, or First Kings, Second Chronicles, Job, Psalms, a bunch of Psalms, Proverbs, Jeremiah, Malachi, John, Acts, Romans, James, First Peter, 
So it's all through the Scripture this word gets used. Another thing that I want to bring out, and we're going to come back to this slide, but I really wanted to bring out some things in this. So every word is in all bold, and then every usage of that word is listed, and then it's given what verse it's listed in. Okay, so if you've ever been around when I've done one of my topical studies on, say, oh, uh, I don't know, um, marriage. Well, what I'm going to look up? Marriage, wed, wedding. I can grab Strong's Concordance and I can quickly find every single verse in the Bible that talks about marriage or wedding or married. So you just got to think really quickly, what are all the words we would use in English having to do with married, husband, wife, marry, wed, and you just can grab your strongs real quick and go, dee, 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 dee. and within about 20 minutes, you can have the whole list of every verse in the Bible that talks about that subject. You guys, I promise you, even after as many years in school that I've done, I couldn't tell you every verse that had to do with a given subject. Strong's already done the work for me. So that's how I find those verses to gather them all together to build the study to see all the things that the Bible has to say about a particular topic. Okay? So now it gives you all the verses, but you'll notice over here on the far right are a list of numbers. Some of those numbers are the same, and some of those numbers are different. Okay? I want you to recognize something that's going on here. I want you to look at this list of numbers right here. It's 835s and 833s and 7951s. And then suddenly you get down here to this one, and it goes from regular type to italics type. The letters are leaning. You notice that? What's going on? Well, the standard type is all in the Old Testament. It's Hebrew and Aramaic. If it's got an italic number, you've shifted into the Greek. So you're in the New Testament. And that's borne out also. Proverbs, Jeremiah, Malachi is the last book in the Old Testament. And it's the last one of these listed that has a standard type number. John is in the New Testament. The New Testament was written in Greek, so the Greek numbers are all italicized. So it's a really quick way to know whether you're going to look in the Hebrew dictionary or the Greek dictionary. And you're like, whoa, wait a minute, time out. i got to go find another dictionary? No. That's the beauty of Strong's Concordance. He's not only got the whole list of everywhere a book... Uh, a word is used in the Bible, but then he also has a complete Hebrew dictionary and a complete Greek dictionary. And every single word is numbered, and the number matches all the way through. So what we're seeing here is in Genesis 30 and verse 13, the Hebrew word is word number 837. And in Deuteronomy 33, 29, it's word 835. And in 1 Kings and 2 Chronicles and Job and Psalms, and all the way down here, it's all 835. Proverbs 3.18 has a weird one. It's got an 833. So, so far we've got three Hebrew words that are translated into English as happy. That's not uncommon if you do linguistic work. Languages sometimes use different words for different meaning. There, it, it, in English, we have one word for really cold water that comes out of the sky. We call it snow. And we put all kinds of adjectives in front of it. Light snow, fluffy snow, wet snow. We, we'll describe the snow. If you go up to Alaska and visit with the Inuits, the, the, the original people of Alaska, they actually have over 15 words for snow because they live in Alaska. <coughs> Excuse me. 
So you've got different words. <coughs> Excuse me. Going from language to language. Okay. So what I have done is I have taken the liberty of jumping from the concordance section to the dictionary section of this book. But I want you to be able to read the dictionary when we get there. Because, you know, dictionary entries are weird. They're, they're not written in standard, easy-to-read stuff. So I wanted to make this make sense to you, and that's what this is. This is an example of how a dictionary section works. For example, the first thing on every entry, and you can see it over here to the far left, and this particular has 66, 28, 29, okay, is Strong's number, okay? And so once you have the Strong's number, that works all the way through the book for the Hebrew and the Greek, okay? The next thing is, is any cross-reference, unnumbered, you know, any unnumbered cross-reference entries like this one. There's no number on this one. Don't know exactly why, but it directs you to this other number. So this word carries the same meaning as this one down here, and they'll kind of unfold that as it goes. Then you're going to have the original Hebrew what it would look like if you were actually looking at the original language. And then following that is an English transliteration. That's a big word. Translation is when we change the word from its original language to the new language. For example, if you studied Spanish, you know perro is the English word dog. They don't look anything alike, okay? But there are some words that we just steal straight out of an original language to a new language. For example, taco. We just stole the word. There isn't an English word for taco. We stole the Spanish word for their food because it was easier than trying to find an English equivalent because we didn't have anything in English that would be an equivalent. And so what this that's called a transliteration. If you go from one word in the original to a different word in the new language, that's translation. If I just use the same noise, this is what it sounds like in this language and I'm going to make it sound like that in my language, that's transliteration. And so what's going on here is that Hebrew that's there next to the 6628 that first letter is a TZ sound, and then you've got a couple of vowels and an L. So the easiest way for us to say that is L. Okay? And so that's what it's saying right there. So you get the original Hebrew, and then you get the English equivalent, what, what it would sound like if you were trying to read, write it down in English. Okay? Then the next thing you get is phonetic. So, is it se'el or se'el? Where's the accent? Well, you can see the accent on the first syllable. So it comes back just like a regular dictionary that you've been using. A couple of weeks ago, I had somebody ask the question, how do you read all the names in the Bible? There's one way to do it. You can look up Strong's and see how they've got it busted out to try to learn how to say it, okay? Um, then you're going to get all kinds of information about that word, usages on that word, special symbols, abbreviations, and there's all kinds of stuff for you to learn different pieces about that word. Okay, that's enough on that. So given that, if we go back here, I've got 837s, 835s, uh, 833s, 7951s, so we're looking at the Hebrew. So the Hebrew numbers give me from 833 to 837 and then a 7951. So I go back here a little bit deeper into my book. And what I find is columns in this book 
I'll hold it up. You can come up and look at it later. But these columns of words, instead of a dictionary form having only two columns, it actually has three columns on every page. And so what I did was I went to the page that actually has the 833 to 837 to 830 whatever. And so this page actually has from 833 to 838. So that covers the 833, the 835, and the 837 that we had in our original when it, we were looking at happy. Well, let's look then at 833. Ashar is a primitive root to be straight, um, to be level, right, happy. Figuratively, to go forward, be honest, prosper. Call blessed or be blessed or happy to go, guide, lead, or relieve. So it's got a lot of different translative work, but it comes down to be happy, be blessed, be in the lead. Okay? Then you got down to 835. Esher comes from the 833 root word, Ash, Asher. Now is Esher, went from an A to an E, and in this one, it is happiness. So it's not just happy, it's happiness. It's a different form of the word, so it gets a different number, okay? And so as I look at, it says only in the masculine plural construct as an interjection, how happy, how blessed, how, what what happiness? It's only ever used in the language in that way. Okay? So I'm gleaning information. Is all of this information useful to me? It depends what I'm studying. Why am I looking up the word? Okay? We get down here to 837, and it's Osher. So we've got A, E, and O. This one, again, is from the 833 root, and it also means happiness or happy. So there's no real big tricks to the word happy. That's why I picked this one. Okay, it was pretty simple to present. I've told you guys in the past that there are five different words, or four different words in the, in the Greek for love. And those words are hugely different. Brotherly love, the love I have for a child, the love I have for um, hmm. yeah, romantic love, and love that is pure like God love. So there's different words for those things. I mean, think about it. We just say love. In English, you say you love your mama and you say you love pizza. You don't mean the same thing. And in, in other languages, they have different words to demonstrate what kind of love you have for different things. Okay. So this, so what we've done so far is we've said, okay, I'm going to look up the word happy. And I'm going to say, okay, I'm looking at this Second Chronicles verse, and it's 835. Well, that's what most of them are, is an 835. Well, sweet. So it just means this word, happy. Excellent. But wait, we've got this outlier. What's the deal with this 7951? So we flip back a couple of pages, and we've got this is from 7950 down to 7956. We're looking specifically for 7951. This word, shalav, is used in Job 3.26. It is a primitive, primitive root that means to be tranquil, that is secure, successful, to be happy, to be prosperous, to be in safety. So it's much more of a peaceful type of happiness rather than a giddy type of happiness, okay? And so as we look at this and we go back, there we go.
Wherefore are all they happy that? So there's something going on in Jeremiah 12, 1 that the author Jeremiah wanted us to understand. This isn't just your normal happy like, hey, we're going to Disneyland. This is the happiness of curling back up in mom's arm and being totally accepted and being at peace and being tranquil and everything just being awesome that level of happiness. And so there's two different words being used here, and we can tease that out with the Strong's Concordance. So then I'm going to go down to the introduction to the Greek, and it's set up exactly the same. So as you look at that page, you're going to get exactly the same setup, except you'll notice all the numbers are italicized, because we're now in the Greek, it will give you the Greek version. It'll give you an English transliteration. Then it will give you a phonetic chart, and then it'll start to define it and use it. Okay? So knowing that, we can then just go into the Greek. And as we looked back at that other page, 3107 and 3106 were the two words for happy. So now I can go to 3106 and 3107, and in the Greek, makarizo and makarios are the two words that get translated happy. Okay? So the first one, makarizo, is to beautify, beatify, that is, pronounce or esteem fortunate, to call blessed, to count happy. See, hear what's going on here, guys. We will use words in the English that we use then differently in different parts of speech. Um, for example, the root word may be jump. It's a verb to jump. But what happens when I say jumping? I make a participle out of it. It comes into a different part of the sentence. But it's coming from that original root word, jump. It's jumping now. And that's what's happening here. You've got makarizo is a word that comes from the root word of makarios. That is a um, form of the poetic makar, meaning the same, supremely blessed, fortunate, well-off, blessed, happy, happier. So, the root word, makarios, is happy. The makarizo is to call someone happy. So it's whether I'm happy or whether I say, oh, that individual is blessed. That individual is, is. so I'm counting them. So it's whether I'm using it of myself or using it of someone else. So when I'm looking at that then, and I can look back to say, okay, this is what that word really means, I can put that back to our original, I don't know why I keep pointing at the screen, that's not where it's read. There we go. <clears throat> the, the reader that I'm punking is way back there, and I keep pointing it this way. Anyway, as we look there's only one that's the 3106. The rest of them are happy. This one is the one to be counted, counted happy. And it's interesting when you look at James 5.11, what does the wording say? We count them happy which endure. You see, because that's what it translated. That word means to count one happy. So when they were translating it into English, they didn't just say they are happy, they say, no, we count them happy because that's the way the word is used. That's the 3106. Now, in this book then, I have this whole section is every one of the 14,000 words in the Bible, in alphabetical order, and all of the places it shows up. Then, this whole section is all of the Greek dictionary, or the Hebrew dictionary, I'm sorry. 
That's the Hebrew dictionary. And then there's a Greek dictionary. And then there's more stuff. There's all kinds of material in here. There's a chart on the months in the Jewish calendar. There's a chart in here on the weights and measures of ancient Israel compared to what is a mina? What is a uh, a, a denarius? What is a, you know, how much is that? If I say it's so many bushels or so many bins or whatever, how much is that? Well, there's a chart in here that has that. There are all sorts of different supplements in here. And then the biggest majority of this back section is actually a topical research. So you can come back at the very end of the book after you've looked at the words you're looking for, and there is a topical study guide on happiness. And it's going to deal through where does happiness come from, is derived from, fear of God, trust in God, obedience to God, wisdom's ways, and the verses that support that topical study. Do you know happiness and examples of happiness in Israel and Job and Mary and Paul, various verses. Happiness of the saints in spite of discipline, suffering, persecution, lack, trouble. So here you've got imagery of people that are demonstrating happiness even though life sucks. And that's a really cool thing. You know, where's that verse? Well, it's right there, and it helps you to find that. Same as what happens with the happiness, because this is happiness of the saints. Well, the Bible also talks about happiness in the wicked. What does the Bible say about happiness in folks that aren't followers of God? Well, their happiness is short, uncertain, vain, limited to this life, and is under God's judgment, and all the verses to back that up. So if you're trying to put together your own study and you're trying to look for certain answers, he's already done all the work for you. Okay. I, I spend not a tremendous amount of time in Strong because it, but when I was first pastoring, I lived in this book. Okay. I used it constantly to put Sunday school lessons together, to put uh, sermons together, to put an understanding together. You know, this is how, I, I know you guys have, that have been through my class or have been through my teaching, when I've talked about the restoration of Peter, when Peter is restored by Christ, after he's denied him three times, Christ is crucified, he's resurrected, and then towards the end of the gospel, there's this story where Jesus comes up to Peter and he says, do you love me? And he says, you know that I love you. He says, okay, go feed my sheep. And he says, Peter, second time, do you love me? Yes, you know I love you. Then take care of my lamb. Hey, Peter, what do you love me? I've told you twice already. Yes, I love you. What's interesting there is it was not until I read through that passage with my strongs in hand that I caught the difference in loves. Because Jesus says, Peter, do you agape me? Do you love me the way God loves? And Peter responds, Lord, you know I phileo you. I love you like a brother. See, he didn't answer what Jesus asked him. Do you love with a God love? No, man, I love you like a brother. Mm, wrong answer. Hey, Peter, do you agape me? Do you love me with a God love? Jesus, you know I phileo you. Love you like a brother. Third time. And this is the really cool thing about that story. Is the third time that Jesus comes back, he says, Peter, do you phileo me? Do you love me like a brother? Peter never does get it. He answers the third time, phileo again. But that's the beauty of Christ. That when Peter kept failing, he just changed the question so that Peter could be successful. And he reinstates him and he makes him the leader of the disciples at that point. But how did I trip into that? Using my strong.
because I was sitting there reading through that passage in the Strong's and looking at the, the love in that. And so I'd gone, I already knew the Bible passage I was looking at. And so I flipped open to love and went down to those three or four passages. Do you love me? I love you. Do you love me? I love you. Do you love me? I love you. Six different times love is used. And it kept going back and forth on that far right column. It was, if I went back to another one of these pages, yeah, that one. Instead of, let's pretend this is love instead of happy, instead of being 835 all the way down and 833 somewhere else, it was like 835, 833. 835, 833. 835, it was like, wait, he's not answering the same way. He's using a different word. Whoa, that's cool. What are these two different words? And flipped back there and started looking at him. That one's God love and that one's brotherly love. Oh! And I tripped into this and started to have a full meaning and understanding, a totally different approach to understanding what was going on in that passage. Guys, I have absolutely no intent of making you Bible scholars, okay? I, I, I do not intend for you to take Greek and Hebrew for the rest of your lives. That's not my point. My point is sometimes when you're doing your personal Bible study, you run into a word and you're like, I wonder what that really means. Strong's can answer it. You, you, you might be looking at something, you might say, hey, I want to know where, where every time that Jesus talks about, oh, I don't know, pick subject. Every time, Jesus, every time God speaks about or the Bible speaks about marriage, I can look that up. Or a particular sin. Let's say theft. Let's say, what does the Bible say about theft? And I can look up the word theft, thieve, steal, take. And I can look every single place in the Bible that word shows up. And I can start to understand a fuller context of what's going on there. Because I don't know the Greek. I mean, I had a year of it, but that's the equivalency of first grade. Okay, so I can speak Greek like you know, a kindergartner. You know, I had the Hebrew in my seminary, but again, long before that, I was pastoring. I was already preaching from the pulpit. How in the world was I doing Greek and Hebrew studies in my first pulpit when I hadn't had Greek and Hebrew? Because Strong's had already done the work. Strong's had already done that. So that is a great way for you as a pew sitter, for you as just Joe Normal living out life, but you want to get a little bit deeper. You want to be able to do a, a little more intimate study. You want to look at what words might mean and if it helps. Because the reality is most all of the Bible, I'm not going to call a percentage, but it's a high percentage, okay? Most all of the Bible, you can read the Bible just exactly like what it says, and it's right, okay? There's no more tricks in the box. It says don't do this. It means don't do this. It's pretty simple. It says do this, do that. It's pretty simple. But sometimes a word gets lost because of a difference in culture, and you miss out on something that was written there, like the whole thing with Peter and Jesus. If you just read it in English, do you love me? Yeah. And you can get the whole crux of the story. You can understand that, you know, three times Peter denied Jesus, and three times Jesus asked him, do you love me? He was reinstating him. He was putting him back. And you can totally understand that just reading it in English. But doing a little bit of word study opened up an even deeper meaning there because of how that was used in the original language. And you can see, oh, there's different words being used here and something's going on. And you can spend some time in thought and prayer and questioning and allow the Holy Spirit to help you to, to deal through what's really, what's really going on here. It doesn't change what you read in the English. Okay? I have never done a single bit of word study that changed what the Bible says. What it does is it deepens my understanding of that word. I'll close out tonight with an old joke. Actually, I have to give full credit. 
I think it was um, Camry Hoggett that told you this joke, um, who was uh, one of Mickey's professors in her college days. Um, two elderly ladies go to a baseball game. They take with them a bottle of whiskey. By the bottom of the fifth, the bags were loaded. Do you understand how much culture you have to understand for that joke to be funny? If you were in a culture that didn't have baseball, the references to the fifth wouldn't mean anything because they wouldn't realize that innings, who's up to bat? You have to understand the game. That, that a pejorative term for elderly ladies is a bag. That there's a secondary meaning that a fifth is a fifth of a gallon of alcohol is how it's served out. So if you don't understand all of those cultural things that are going on, to read what I had written, if, if Peter, James, and John from the second century were reading that paragraph, they would have no clue what was going on. They wouldn't understand why everybody in the crowd was laughing because they've never been to a baseball game. They don't know the fifth and they don't know the bags. That's what this kind of work can show you. It can help you to get back into the culture of the first century to understand how they used words back then to discover meaning. There is a lot of stuff that when I read the Bible, I didn't think was funny. And when I started reading it in its original language through the Strong's and other tools, I found all kinds of jokes one of the things that Jews love, and you're going to get into this, John, they love word games. They were punny. There are a lot of times where the writer will use a word and then twist that word in another meaning three words later. And when we're reading it in the English, it goes, meow. Because the English doesn't carry the, the, the same word joke, and we miss the pun. We miss what we, it's a, we read it, we understand it, it means what it says, but when I read it in English, I don't giggle. When I read it in, Jew, in, 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 in Hebrew or in Greek, it's like, <laughs> I saw what you just did there. I mean, there's a whole lot of, I see what you just did there, in the original language that just doesn't translate. And so by doing this kind of word work, it can open up that understanding. It can open up a deeper meaning. It doesn't change it. It's not like, oh, now I have some insight that you all lack. No. The Bible's readable. Pick it up. Read it. Right there. The Word of God. Holy Spirit will work in you, and you'll get it. But as we study, you know, when you read through the Bible the first ten times, you just need to read it in English. But as you keep reading it, one of the ways that you get deeper into it is to start doing some of this language work, starting to do some of the, the digging and the scratching. of. Okay, I've read this story five times. Did I miss anything? And sometimes working with a Strong's or working with another tool like that, picking up a commentary where somebody might bring out something that you culturally didn't know or didn't understand that adds to that meaning. And you go, oh, that's funny now. I see that. I'll, I'll use a silly example here. Jesus with the woman at the well. In English, it reads like it reads. But when you start to understand the culture, why in the world was this girl at the well in the middle of the day? Because all the other girls got their water in the morning. 
Why was she not with all the girls getting her water in the morning? Because she was an outcast. And Jesus busts out on her later and asks, How many husbands, or, you know, where's your husband? And she says, I don't have a husband. He's like, Yeah, I know, you've had five. And the man you're with now isn't your husband. Wonder why she was an outcast? See what's going on here? Well, you've got a marriageable age man traveling with his posse. He runs all the boys off. Now I want you to think back to, oh, I don't know, let's say when the servant was sent to go get Isaac a wife. Where did he go? The well. All the pretty girls come to get their water from the well. So the single girls come and get the water from the well. So if you're a man coming into town looking for a hot chick, you go to the well. In the morning, if you're looking for a pure one, but in the afternoon, if you're not. And when you start to see that, you'll start to figure out that the whole conversation between Jesus and the woman in the well at the well is loaded with sexual overtones. He is leading her along. Hey, get me a drink. You Jews don't ask us for drinks. You go, to, you go find yourself a Jewish woman. No, 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 you give me something to drink, sweetheart. Well, the well's deep. That's okay. The, the sexual overtone is all through that. She thinks she's getting picked up on. Guys, how often do we check this? You know, you're looking over going, hmm, she got a ring on? So, of course, he's going to end the conversation with, so, uh, where's your husband? I don't have a husband. And it's at that point that Jesus flips the script. You're right. You've had five husbands and the man you're with now isn't your husband which is why she responds, whoa, I perceive you are a prophet. And she hasn't said thing one about all of that history. She hasn't said thing one about all of that past. And so when you start to look at it from the language side and from the culture side, there's a depth to it. Here this woman is at the well, and there's this good-looking marriageable guy hanging out at the well and he starts talking to her and it, I mean it, these are pickup lines at the Jewish bar and she's playing right into it right up until that point he's got her full attention and then he flips it and she goes whoa and he turns her in to a missionary to the entire city of Samaria he helps her to understand who the Messiah really is. And you have to understand the whole cultural deviation between the Jews and the Samaritans and all that was going on in that. And there's this huge lesson that's going on. Guys, you get that by digging a little deeper. Your Bible is great. Read your Bible over and over and over and over and over. Read it every year. Read it twice a year. Just read it. But as you read through it, it becomes more and more challenging because, guys, let's face it, most people don't read books over and over and over. Okay, you're just weird. She reads like Lord of the Rings every year. I'm like, why? Anyway, um, you know how it ends. Yeah. But most of us, as we're reading something, if we've read it like nine times, we start skipping stuff. Using tools helps you to slow down and not skip stuff, to go looking for stuff that you may have missed the first nine times you read it. 
Okay, so if, if you're a baby Christian or you're just starting out in your faith walk, just read the Bible. But if you've been at this a minute and you're like, you know what, I'd, I'd like to do a little more digging. I'd like to get a little deeper into this. Then there are some wonderful tools like the Strong's Concordance that give you all kinds of valuable information and insight. I picked one, happy, tonight, that there's nothing big about it. What does it mean in the Hebrew? Happy. What does it mean in the Greek? Happy. Okay, so there's not a whole lot to learn there. But my point was teaching you how to use it. The really cool thing is this was published in 1890. The original was. This one's actually 1994. But anyway, it was exactly what Strong hoped it would be. The standard which means everybody uses it. If you're reading through commentaries, there will sometimes be spots in a commentary where it says, well, this word in the original language, and it'll say, Strong's number such and such. It's coded back to the Strong's so you can go, oh, he's talking about that word. Reach over, grab your Strong's off the counter, flip it open, go right to that page, and be able to read the paragraph on that word. Oh, I see what you're saying. That's cool. One of my favorite tools, and I'll, I'll share this with those of you who are beyond Strong's and for whom this is a review. Um, Strong's comes to the Bible from English, from the King James Version. So if I'm going to look up a word, I'm going to look up happy, an English word. But when I look at happy, there were six different words up there, four different Hebrew and two different Greek. I'd really like to just look up the Hebrew or the Greek. You know, how many, where is agape? Where is phileo? Where is makarios? Don't show me happy. Show me the root word for happy. That's these two. They're called the Englishman's Concordance. An Englishman's Concordance is a Hebrew version and a Greek version. And instead of having the English words, it has the Greek and the Hebrew words. They did the exact same thing as strong, but instead of tearing apart the English, they tore apart the original language. And so you can look up a specific word in the Greek or in the Hebrew and every place that it shows up. And it's just exactly like the Strong's. There's the word and every place it shows up and a piece of the verse and a numbering system. It's totally right there. Really cool thing about this. I'll read you the cover. It says, The Englishman's Greek Concordance of the New Testament. Pretty little artwork. Underneath it says, Coded with Strong's Concordance Numbers. So I can grab my strong as I can flip it open and say, hey, I'm looking up the word have, and it is in this. I'm saying, well, I'll go to the heart Hebrew. Okay, have winds up being 1961. So I can flip my book open here to 1961, and I can tell you every single place that that word, 1961, whatever Hebrew or Greek word that is, Right here, every single place it shows up. So if you're trying to do a study, you know, you want to do, you don't want to look up love and then look through every one of those for the number for agape, you can just look up agape. And it's already separated out for you. So there's tools out there that I just want you to be aware of. Guys, if, if you've got a Strong's at home, flip it open and start using it. Just get familiar with it. There's all kinds of great stuff. And like I said, most of the time, there's no deep insight there. It's like, okay, what does this word mean in the original? <laughs> Same thing as it means in English. Okay, that was a wash. But sometimes you'll trip into something that will deepen your understanding and will help you to grow and mature in your faith. We close in a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, Lord, tonight I have talked about one of the tools that's outside of your Scripture that brings us back to helping us to understand Your Scripture better. Lord, Your Holy Spirit does a lot of work in our heart to help us to understand what we're reading, to bring us to 
a full knowledge of you. But Lord, this beautiful work was written by people 2,000 years ago and beyond in their language and in their culture. And Lord, we don't have a time machine. So it's tough sometimes to get the deeper meanings and the puns and the, the things that are there that the original readers would have gotten. Just like we get the joke about the bottom of the fifth and the two bags being loaded. We laugh because we get it. And Lord, I pray that as we, as a people, continue to study Your Word, counting on it as our only guide to faith and practice, that we would make use of the tools that are around us to help us to understand it better. Lord, I pray for those that are here tonight that are brand new to the Word, and I pray that You would give them insight, that You would give them the ability to read and to understand, that they would not feel any shame or any uh, backwardness, but if they have questions, to ask it of someone who's worked with the Bible longer so that they can come into a learning and understand how to approach Scripture and how to read it. Lord, I pray that You would help them to find the right Bible. And I don't mean that there's a difference in their truth, but there's a difference in their reading level. And so, Lord, some of our translations are easier to understand than others. And I pray, Lord God, that You would direct each and every person to a word that will be written at a level of language that they can understand and grasp so that they can grapple with the truth and not with the syntax of the language. I pray, Lord God, that you would inspire us to dig deeper, to not take our faith as old hat or something that's worn dull, but that, Lord, we might stay invigorated in our challenge. May we continue to read the Bible today with the same passion and love that we read it in the year after we became saved. I pray, Lord God, that you would inspire us to dig in and to know you and your word better. And I pray these things through Christ our Lord. Amen.